Hello and welcome to Melton Vineyard's online service. Our vision as a church can be summed up in three words. Bless, serve, pray. We want to bless others with the unconditional love of Jesus that we have experienced. We'll serve each other and the wider community and we will pray so that we can do all this in the power of God's Spirit. Our vision for these online services is that they're a space where you can explore faith and discover what kind of church we are at your own pace and in your own way. Each week we share a worship song and a short talk which we hope you'll find encouraging and helpful. If you believe that Melton Vineyard might be a church you could call home and you live in or near the Melton area, we would love to welcome you to one of our on-site services, which are every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. at John Fernley College. Let's pray. Father God, please meet with us through your Holy Spirit as we turn our hearts and our thoughts towards you now. In Jesus' name, Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm.
What's the church for? Have you ever asked yourself that question? What's all this for? I mean, what are we doing here this morning? Is this just an opportunity to sing songs together and, uh, and then go and do some nice things in the community? Because the scouts do that. Uh, is it so we can meet up with our friends and get a boost for the week? There are social clubs for that. There has to be more. There has to be more. There is more. In the last few weeks, we've been looking at how we welcome different groups of people into this community, this family we call Melton Vineyard. But what kind of community are we? What are we for? Um, let me make a suggestion. God is building something here. Believe it or not, this is part of God's plan to renew the world. A small part, perhaps, but a part, nevertheless. And week by week, he is forming us into a generous community so that we can cooperate with him in all that he's doing. Um, have you ever seen one of those uh, photo mosaics? If you haven't, here's a rather basic example I made this week. Um, it's obviously a picture of the Hope Centre. It's the picture that's on uh, the front of every welcome pack. But in this instance, it's made up of lots of smaller pictures. If we zoom in, you start to see them. And if we go in even closer, we can see that they're pictures of different Melton Vineyard events over the years. So, look at the big picture, you see the Hope Centre, drill down to the individual photos, and you begin to appreciate all the little details that go to making up that big image. At the details level, it's all those little things that count, coming along to Sundays like this, growing in faith, getting baptised, becoming part of the church family, joining a life group, serving on a team, giving of our time, our energy, our money to support all that we do here together, blessing the community, storehouse, breathing space, life in colour, eaves, so many activities at the Hope Centre. Discipleship growth, inviting our friends, multiplying groups, nurturing our children and youth, praying for each other and for the wider community, enjoying social time together and uh, initiating new projects, listening for the Spirit's direction and more. In the big picture level, we see, if we step back, that God is building something here. He's building a generous community. A people who are discovering how to live with God at the centre, who are giving their best to him, who are learning to trust him for whatever comes next. And uh, it's exciting. It's challenging. It's a journey. This morning, we're, we're just going to think about what this means to be a, a church that values generous community. We're going to explore some of the lesser-known parts of the Bible in order to do that. And uh, the obvious place, of course, to go for something like this would be the book of Acts or maybe Paul's letters. But we're going to go right back much further this week into some of the oldest books in the Bible. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you are building here. I thank you that you invite us to be part of it. You draw us into family and into friendship and fellowship and love, into your truth, into your grace, into your love. Lord, this morning, may we learn more about how we can be, how we can become that generous community. For your name's sake, amen. Don't know if you've been along to any of the deep dive evenings that we have once a month. Uh, it's one of those upper room sessions. We've been recently going through one book of the Bible at a time and uh, getting a feel for how that one book fits into the big storyline of the Bible. Its main themes, its key lessons, its genre, its structure. And uh, so far we have looked at Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and next Sunday we'll be doing a deep dive into Deuteronomy. Don't miss it. I tell you, it's been a fascinating journey. Numbers, in particular, was a real surprise treat. I mean, who knew? Numbers. I mean, what's that even about? It sound, I mean, the name's rubbish, isn't it? it? Sounds like an accountancy manual. Numbers. 
But uh, as it turns out, it's full of fascinating stuff. And yeah, it needs a bit of unpacking because we're looking back into an ancient culture that's very far removed from our own, but there are some fantastic lessons in there about being a generous, faith-filled community, <coughs> often because of how many times they actually got it wrong. But, uh, oh, and Leviticus, that was an unexpected treat as well. Uh, I know, I know, who knew? I mean, it's full of rules and regs, isn't it? But actually, when you start to dig into what they're for and what they're about, it's fascinating. So here goes, folks. Here are three lessons about being a generous community taken just from Leviticus and Numbers. So, lesson number one, putting God at the centre. Leviticus is the third of these five books known collectively as the Pentateuch, a word that just means five books or scrolls. Uh, they're also the first five books of the Bible, and uh, in the Jewish tradition, of course, they're known as the Torah. Uh, and as I've mentioned previously, the Torah has this mirrored structure. The first and the last books, Genesis, Deuteronomy, they're the outer casing. Um, Genesis traces the origins of this people who come to be known as the nation of Israel in the time leading up to the Exodus. And Deuteronomy is a kind of sneak preview of what's going to happen to them after this Exodus event. Both books end with prophecies laying out things that are going to happen to the people in the future. The Exodus itself occurs in those books in between. Uh, the book of Exodus tells how God rescues the people from slavery in Egypt, tests them in the wilderness, and brings them to Mount Sinai where they set up camp and he makes uh, a covenant with them and gives them the Ten Commandments. They stay there camped for a year at the foot of that mountain. The corresponding book in that mirror pattern, Numbers, tells what happens to the uh, people a year later after they break camp and they journey through the wilderness, being tested again. And many of the tests actually echo those in Exodus. And right in the middle of those four books, literally at the center of the Torah, at the heart, is Leviticus. And it's a book, as we've said, that is a collection of laws and ritual instructions, but it also gives us this deep insight into how God forms the people of Israel into a generous community. So, what does the book tell us about putting God at the centre? Towards the end of the previous book, Exodus, God gives the people this detailed list of instructions on how to construct a tabernacle or a tent. And in Leviticus, we discover the tabernacle is going to be the place where God's presence lives among the people, right at the heart of the community. It is physically at the centre. That's how the camp is laid out, with three tribes on each of the four sides. And, and it's spiritually at the centre. It's the focus of their worship, their sacrifices, and the place where they meet with God. But having God at the centre isn't just a nice design feature or an added bonus. It comes with obligations, with responsibilities, even with some danger. God is a holy God. He's awesome. And people can't just waltz into his presence without giving it a second thought. So Leviticus provides all these detailed instructions about how the people are to prepare themselves to come into God's presence. How they are to remember and thank God for his goodness towards them. And how they are to live differently, showing respect for justice and compassion for the most vulnerable. So immediately, kind of in my head, that raises questions. How much preparation do we make before we come to a meeting like this? Do we just kind of turn up and see what happens? Or do we spend a bit of time in the morning just thinking about where we're going, what it's for? What about the, the way that uh, we're encouraged to thank God and have a heart of gratitude? Are we practicing that attitude of gratitude every day? What about the way that we live with each other in the community? Are we seeking increasingly to put into practice that, that heart for justice, that compassion? for those who are most vulnerable. Some of those sacrifices, of course, are to do with forgiveness and cleansing. And those are the ones that have been replaced now for us by Jesus, once for all sacrifice on the cross. Others are about giving thanks to God and expressing faith in his continuing goodness. And as well as the sacrifices, God also gives them instructions about festivals 
and special seasons, and that's all to help them sort of build into their lives this regular remembering of what God has done for them, helping them to celebrate all that he has been doing and is doing. And that's why we, of course, in the Christian tradition now, have things like Christmas and Easter and Lent and uh, Pentecost and Ascension. And um, as a church, we celebrate our church birthday. It's remembering again and again what God has done for us. And of course, right at the heart of the remembering is the Lord's Supper, which helps us to remember God's presence with us in a tangible way. So there are lessons for us in all of this. We are today called, invited to put God at the centre of our lives. We are also encouraged to recognise the obligations, the responsibilities and the privileges that that entails. We too are called not simply to breeze into church, sing a few songs and go home again, but to recognise that every time we gather as his people, we are coming into the very presence of God. According to the New Testament, we are the tabernacle now. We're the tabernacle or the temple, as it became. We're the place where God's presence dwells. So as we gather as his people, his presence becomes tangible to us in a way that isn't quite the same when we're just off living our separate lives out there. And so for us too, putting God at the centre means learning to love justice and compassion and living differently with each other. God isn't just an added extra, a lifestyle accessory in this consumer society that we all now live in, where we pick and mix the things we like. He's to be at the heart of our decision making, our values, our priorities, our choices and our life together as a generous community. And the reason for all of this isn't because God is picky and demanding and fussy. It's just because he wants us to access the blessings um, in our lives in greater measure. And that happens as we become integrated into and contributing part of that generous community. Lesson two, giving God our best. One thing that comes through loud and clear as you read these, all about these sacrifices is that people were always encouraged to give God their best. So for instance, just to pick one example, in Leviticus chapter 2 verse 12, the description of a grain offering says, when anyone brings a grain offering to the Lord, your offering is to be of the finest flour. You're to pour olive oil on it, put incense on it, and take it to Aaron's sons, the priests. The finest flour mixed with costly olive oil and incense offered up to God. Actually, I'm not sure that would taste very nice once it's got incense on it, but anyway. Whether it was a grain sacrifice or an animal sacrifice, the people were encouraged to bring God their best, not their leftovers. Incidentally, as I read through all these instructions, I'm hugely relieved we don't have to do animal sacrifice anymore. I mean, for one thing, I'm not sure how it would go down with John Fernley if we were slaughtering cows here on a regular basis. And for another... I also discovered recently that it wasn't just the priest who did the slaughtering. (laughs) The people who brought the sacrifice got their hands dirty as well. They were up to the elbows in blood. They had to do a lot of the gutting and the slicing up. and mm, Yeah, nice. Um, But interestingly, I discovered something else as well that I hadn't spotted before uh, as we looked at Leviticus in detail. And that is that with many of these sacrifices, those who brought the sacrifice actually got to share in the blessings of it. Yeah? The parts of the animals that were considered to be the best portions, the fatty bits, the kidneys and the other internal organs, sorry, vegetarians, um, they were burnt on the altar as a food offering to, to, to God. Some other portions were given to the priests uh, and the Levites to support them in their ministry. Uh, and the remainder was for the person bringing the sacrifice to share with family and friends. So it got me thinking about the sacrifices that we bring to God on a regular basis. You'll have noticed every week, uh, certainly if you've stuck for six or more, that we say each week, you know, this thing about two baskets will be coming round. One is full of chocolates, help yourself to one of those. Uh, The other is for our offering, which is part of our worship to God. But if you're a visitor here or you give by standing order, etc., etc. But, you know, as with the people of Israel, we don't want to give God our leftovers, our loose change. We want to bring our first fruits to him as a way of saying thank you for all that he gives us, as a way of expressing our faith and our trust in him. 
as we contribute to the ministries that go on here. And because of God's generosity, there's still plenty left over for us to share with family and friends. Some things are different these days, of course. As I've said, we don't bring sheep to church these days. Um, We tend to do it more by standing order um, rather than stuffing bundles of notes in, uh, and that's helpful. But those who are committed to this principle of generous giving have thought carefully about the proportion of income that we want to give regularly as we listen to God in prayer. We understand our responsibility to provide for the practical costs of ministry, just as the offerings of the ancient Israelites helped to support the work that happened in the tabernacle and uh, later the temple. And we seek to bring our best to God as an expression of our faith that he will continue to provide for our needs as we do that. Which is a, a really good opportunity, an important opportunity for me to say thank you, thank you to all of you who support the work that goes on here through faithful giving. It's because of your generosity that we're able to do all the things we do. The big things like storehouse and breathing space, all the other smaller events and activities that are just as valuable and significant, they're all made possible by the generous support of those who feel this is their family. This is my family. I'm I'm part of this. So we especially appreciate the fact um, that in these tough economic times, you've continued to be faithful which has meant that, you know, even uh, once again this last year, even though things have been tighter, we have still been able to pay our bills and give generously to other projects as well. Things like the work in Honduras, for example. Um, We make a commitment always to give away 20% of new income that uh, we receive to things and to projects that don't directly benefit us. That's part of our commitment to, to generous giving ourselves as a generous community. Um, if you're new to here to Melton Vineyard and you haven't heard me talk about this stuff before, it's worth saying that there are uh, giving leaflets on the welcome table and also there's a giving page on our website. And I'd encourage you, if you've never looked at those, to either pick one up uh, or have a look at the giving page because it gives you all sorts of information about where the money goes, how you can become part of this generous community if you want to. Um, standing order, we always mention that every week, but it is actually incredibly helpful um, if people are, are regularly giving in a faithful way because then that means we know what the income is for the year ahead and we can plan accordingly. Um, so uh, also if you decide to give and you're a UK taxpayer, uh, it's incredibly helpful if people also fill in the gift aid declaration on the form because uh, it doesn't cost you any extra, but it, every year it makes the difference between whether we actually meet our our costs or don't. Uh, And it's really important that we are transparent in all of this, of course, as well. So if you you want to know all the details about how the money is spent, then um, you can talk to any of the trustees. They're they're on the website. Uh, You can go onto the Charity Commission website. You can look at our annual reports where we report all of this stuff. And uh, plus we issue a, a church annual report every year, and that also has... Lots of detailed information about this. There'll be another one coming out uh, in the new year. And as we think about bringing God our best, obviously we're not just talking about money. We're also talking about our time, our energies, our gifts, our motivations, our skills, our God-directed passions. Caroline mentioned last week about volunteering at Storehouse, particularly through talking with some of the visitors and praying with them. Uh, And that might be something that you would want to get involved with. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that we needed drivers for the minibus on Sunday mornings. We'd still ideally like to find one more. And even if you're not a driver, we'd value one or two more people to come along as helpers on that. Those are just two suggestions, but of course, you know, there's the giving on a t- um, serving on a team leaflet and all of that, uh, that that give you ideas about places where you could get involved and become part of this generous community and give God your best. But giving God our best means we're part of this. We get to share in the privileges and in the blessings. Lesson number three, trusting God for what comes next. The book of Numbers, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, do read it sometime. It's packed with uh, stories and life lessons. So we can only take a very brief look at this this morning. But um, the first thing that happens is Moses takes a census Uh, which is where the book actually gets its English name from. He counts the numbers of fighting men in each tribe to assess their military strength 
in preparation for the attack on Canaan. Oh, that isn't Moses, by the way. Um, it's, Moses doesn't look scary like that. Uh, that's actually um, Balaam, the prophet, that uh, King Balak gets to try and curse the people. He wants, uh, he wants Balak to come and stand on a high place, look at all the people and issue a curse. And every time, God doesn't give him permission. God just says, you've got to bless them. So he's up there being paid to, to curse Israel. And, all the, and the only thing he can do is bless them. It's, it's fabulous. The, the people of Israel are all down in the, in the valley, all squabbling with each other and being like children. And God is still blessing them. He's still blessing them. Uh, anyway, that's a bit of a side bar there. Um, once the census is completed, they, uh, they break camp. They set out on the journey to the promised land. They reach its borders. Moses sends in 12 spies, one for each of the tribes, to get the lie of the land. And they come back saying, we went to the land to which you sent us. And it does indeed flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. Isn't it great? Looks, but the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. All the people we saw there are of great size. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and, and, and we looked the same to them. In other words, yeah, it's a great idea, but could we not do that attacking Canaan thing? If that's okay, you know. Just two of the spies, Caleb and Joshua, come back with a different story. They say, look, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He'll give it to us. But, but don't rebel against the Lord. Don't be afraid of the people, but we're going to devour them. Uh, their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. But in the end, the spies who bring this negative report are the ones that um, get a hearing. They're the ones who shout loudest. Uh, they instigate a mutiny against Moses and his leadership. They try to appoint a new leader who will take them all back into slavery. <laughs> We're just going to go back to Egypt. And uh, to that point, they're just refusing to go into the promised land. And, and basically, God honors their choice. He honors their choice. He says, okay, if that's, if that's what you want, then this generation will wander for 40 years and die in the wilderness. And, and it's your children that are going to get to go in to the promised land. It'll be the next generation that enjoys it, the blessings. So because the people were afraid, because they didn't trust God, because they didn't exercise any faith, they lost the chance to be part of what God was doing. Now, it didn't stop God doing what he wanted to do, but it added a 40-year delay. It's the next generation who got to take possession of the land because they exercise faith. So what's the lesson for us in all of this? I mean, it's pretty simple, really, isn't it? Decisions taken from a place of fear tend to end badly. It's not that God abandons the people. He still takes care of them. He still provides for them. He still cares for their needs. But they miss out. They just miss out on being part of his good plans. When the spies went in to check out the land, they saw people who looked to them like giants, overwhelmingly scary. And they just came back full of fear. And then they made their choices and their decisions on that basis. I can't do it. It's too frightening. The giants in your life may be money worries. They may be health problems. They may be family troubles. But however big they are, they're not as big as God's love for you and his care for you, and his good plans for your life. And that's what we have to hang on to as we make decisions from a place of trust and faith. Those have much better outcomes in the long run. The next generation don't necessarily have it easy. There are still challenges to be overcome and difficulties they have to face. It's not a, a, an easy ride for them. But they know that because they are in the center of God's will, because they're being obedient to him, listening for his voice and, then, and following, he's going to come through for them. And he does. So God invites us to be bold and courageous as we follow him. So a, a simple question for all of us this morning. Where is God challenging you to trust him right now? Is there a decision you're facing at the moment where it feels like there's a, a safe option uh, or there's a God option? If so, pray hard. Listen for God's voice. Check things out with other Christians who you trust. That's part of being in a community. We don't just kind of go off and make decisions on our own without 
getting the wisdom of others. And once you have a clear sense of where God is taking you, then step out boldly and put your faith in him and in his love for you. As a church community too, we have to do our absolute best to follow God's direction, to let him lead us into whatever is coming next and be part of all that he's building here. And I'm excited. I'm excited. It is exciting. It is challenging. It is a journey. But I believe God has more ahead of us than we have experienced yet. And uh, it's about being bold, being, making those decisions from a place of trust and faith and seeing what God's going to do. So what is church for? Well, I'm going to end with a, a quote from this week's Lectio 365 that sums it up really well, I think. There is an eventual state to which creation is heading, where God's will really is done on earth as it is in heaven. We sang it this morning. That is the goal to which all life, indeed the whole of creation, is oriented. We get to know God and work with him to contribute to this unfolding vision here and now. It's a much richer work than simply trying to get people to sign up to heaven when they die or putting God to one side now and striving towards earthly justice in our own strength. It's a powerful invitation to be that generous community for God. Just
Thank you for watching. We hope you found this online service helpful and encouraging. If you'd like to find out more about Melton Vineyard or get in touch with us, our website is meltonvineyard.org.uk and of course you can find us every Sunday morning at 10.30am at John Fernley College on Scorford Road. If you're able to make it to one of those on-site services, we would love to meet you. In the meantime, may God bless you.